Good morning um, and welcome. My name is Simon Allison. I am the Africa editor of the Mail and Guardian newspaper and this is the View on Africa briefing at the Institute for Security Studies. Today I am going to be talking to you about my experiences covering the recent election in Kenya, or at least the election that was supposed to happen in Kenya on the 26th of October. And in some parts of the country, that election did happen. People went to polling stations, they filled in their ballots, they put those ballots in ballot boxes and those votes were counted. But I was in a place called Kisumu, which is Kenya's third largest city. It's in the west of the country, a very beautiful town on the banks of Lake Victoria. And in Kisumu, the vote did not happen. There was no election whatsoever, in fact. It was an eerie experience. I have been a foreign correspondent for a few years now and I've covered a lot of elections in my time, but this was the first election where I could not find anyone willing to cast a vote. Now I'm sure most of our viewers today are familiar with the context that these recent Kenyan elections took place in, but let me just run through it quickly. Kenyans first went to the polls in September. But the presidential election then was annulled by the Supreme Court. The court said that there had been too many irregularities in that vote um, and it castigated the Kenyan Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, which it said um, had been responsible for those irregularities and had not done enough to ensure a free and fair or even a credible election. So. A shiny new vote was scheduled for October 26th, and the idea was that Kenya would just rerun that vote from September. The problem was that the very same electoral commission, which had made all the mistakes in the first round, was also in charge of organizing the second round. And, at least in the eyes of opposition leader Raila Odinga and his party, um, that electoral commission did not do enough to ensure that this election, this new election, would be free and fair. So he said um, that he was going to withdraw from the polls and he told his supporters to boycott the election. Now, Raila Odinga, the opposition leader, he's from Kisumu. This is his territory. It has always been an opposition stronghold. And in Kisumu, on election day, people listened to him, by and large. They stayed at home. They did not vote. Um, the city was basically on lockdown the whole day. Doors were, were, were closed, windows were closed, doors were locked. Um, some of my colleagues, my chain smoking colleagues, couldn't even find anywhere to buy cigarettes. That's how shut down um, the city was. Even the polling stations themselves, where people were supposed to vote, those were deserted. Um, except for small bands of vigilantes, mostly young men, um, who are sort of crowded outside the polling stations, there to make sure that just in case anyone did feel like voting, well, they probably wouldn't be allowed to. In fact, they threatened um, unspecified consequences should anyone um, choose to exercise their right to vote. Now, this was the situation in Kisumu, and in fact, Ryla's call to boycott the election was pretty successful nationwide. Turnout was only 34%. And that is actually nothing, especially when you compare it to turnout in the September poll, the original poll, where turnout was 80%. Um, this means that a huge percentage of registered voters in Kenya either listened to Ryla and stayed at home, or were too scared to go out to vote, or simply decided that they were fed up with the current political crisis, which has dragged on and on and shows little sign of being resolved anytime soon. But I'm not here today to talk to you about voter turnout. Um, instead, I want to speak to you about what I witnessed on election day in Kisumu um, that has really stuck with me. Um, and it's made me worry about where Kenya is headed, where this political crisis is headed, and how it can be resolved. Of course, we know that dozens of people have already died this year in political violence. Um, and I'm worried that there will be more based on the experiences that I had in Kisumu. Now, let me make one thing very clear. Um, Kenya is a big country and I am one person. 
um, I wasn't everywhere. My observations and my conclusions are drawn from the city of Kisumu, which of course has its own unique context and history and regional politics. Nonetheless, what happens in Kisumu, what happened in Kisumu at a micro level may actually be more significant than any number of sort of big picture analyses looking at the whole country, because I think it's at this sort of granular level of detail that sometimes um, bigger truths can be revealed. Um, and actually, there, 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 there is one story that I want to tell today um, because I think it illustrates the point that I want to make, um, which is really about how politics in Kenya at the moment is, is, is the politics of provocation rather than the politics of peace or the politics of democracy. Um, and in this context, it's hard to see where the situation goes from here. So my story starts with the police. There was a huge police presence in Kusumu on voting day. These were not local police. Um, they had been brought in from other parts of the country. Um, they were heavily armed, all wearing body armor, all carrying big scary rifles or batons. Um, and in the run up to the vote, there had already been several instances of police brutality between police um, firing live fire on, on, on demonstrators. Um, or, or, you know, attacking demonstrators who, who were opposed to the vote. Um, even me, like I, I went to the hospital and I was able to speak to several people who still had police bullets inside them when I spoke to them. Um, so understandably in this context, local residents um, seemed to be pretty scared by the police presence. And there was certainly um, hostility between Kasumu residents and the police. And it really didn't help that the week before this rerun election was supposed to take place, um, President Uhuru Kenyatta decided to change the, the identity of the police chief. He sacked the old guy or transferred him and appointed a new guy, someone called John Kamau. Now, John Kamau happens to be from the president's own ethnic group, the Kikuyus. And this move was perceived locally by the sort of politicians and locals that I spoke to. This was perceived as an attempt by the president to control what was happening on the ground in Kusumu. It was also seen as um, a decision that was likely to increase tensions rather than diminish them um, in, in, on the day of the vote. And, you know, what convinced me while I was there that the, you know, let me start again. While I was there, what I saw of the way the police behaved towards the residents of the city convinced me that the police had very little intention of being a neutral arbiter on election day. Um, I witnessed them use live fire against protesters. I witnessed them brutally assault prisoners who they'd captured from demonstrations. Um, and they would beat these prisoners up in a very brazen manner, sort of on the road with, in the full view of um, media cameras, showing that there was very little effort to even, you know, cover up what they were doing. Um, but one incident in particular stood out for me. I followed the convoy of, of the Kisumu governor, Anyang Nyong'o, to an informal settlement in Kisumu called Nyalende. Now, it was getting towards the end of the day, it was dark, it was raining quite heavily at the time. Um, and I was following the governor because he was going to give a speech there. But en route, you know, we were driving through this deserted city, um, weaving our way through hastily manned roadblocks, sort of informal roadblocks by residents. Um, and then we passed a petrol station. And at this petrol station, um, there were 30 or 40 policemen um, huddling under the canopy because they were worried about getting wet. Um, fair enough. So we passed them, they looked at us, and we went on to this informal settlement. The governor gave his speech. About 10 to 15 minutes later, we came back. We retraced our steps and we passed the petrol station again. Except this time, there was something different. The police were still there, under the canopy, motionless. But in the middle of the road, left for dead, pretty much, was a body. It was a young man, and he, his arms and legs were all at awkward angles. It was clear that he had been pretty brutally assaulted. 
he was he was alive and 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 he would um, regain consciousness, but only some four hours later. That's how badly he had been beaten. Now, what was going on here? So this guy was in the middle of the road. Where did he come from? Who had beaten him up? Why had the police not gone to his rescue? Or, as the governor's um, team certainly indicated to us, they believed that the police themselves had seen the governor go past, found someone to beat up, and left this guy here as a message. A message for the governor, left in the middle of the road. A message that was literally written in blood. Now, it's hard to verify what exactly happened that day, but it seems that the governor's team's interpretation of events is probably the most likely, given that there was almost no one on else on the streets. And also given that the police chose not to help this person if someone else was in fact responsible. But the governor's people, well, they had a message of their own. Straight after that incident at the petrol, at the petrol station, I accompanied the governor to another informal settlement, um, Obunga, where the governor gave another speech. Now, Obunga had been the site of a lot of popular protests um, against Uhuru Kenyatta um, and against the vote that was taking place. It is certainly a center of resistance within the city of Kisumu. Um, and there were a couple of hundred young men gathered to hear the governor's speech. They were angry, they were riled up, and while the governor was talking, they were chanting over and over. And what they were saying in English was, we want guns, give us guns. We want guns, give us guns. Now here's the thing. The governor did absolutely nothing to calm the crowd down. I went to speak to one of the governor's top advisors who was standing there watching and I asked him why the, the governor was not taking this opportunity to preach peace. And what this advisor told me, and I quote, he said, we want guns, we will get guns, and we will use them. If we have to turn this place into Somalia or South Sudan to get what we want, then we will, unquote. Now, this is a senior official in the governor's office of a, you know, the governor is a, a major political figure in this part of the country. And in fact, nationally, he's, he's very prominent as well. This is his team speaking to journalists on record saying this kind of thing. This is really scary rhetoric. And the longer Kenya's political crisis goes on, I worry that the rhetoric is likely to become even more scary. Um, and in this context, you know, does it really matter when the party principles, you know, Uhuru Kenyatta or Raila Odinga, all the sort of big national leaders, does it matter when they give speeches in Nairobi and they say, oh, we need re reconciliation or, oh, we need to find a peaceful way of resolving this situation? Does it matter that they say those words in front of the world's cameras when at a local level, um, at, this, at the sort of direct communication between party officials, gov uh, you know, local government officials and communities at that level, um, this kind of inflammatory, almost warlike rhetoric is, is being used. Um, that is what worries me. So I feel like even though at a national level, both parties are, are, are saying the right thing for the most part, at a local level, the messages being sent are very different both by the governor's team, um, you know, quietly sitting there while people chant, we want guns, um, and by the police sent in by President Uhuru Kenyatta, who showed absolutely no compassion um, in dealing with protesters. And in fact, from my perspective, looked like they were using unnecessary force um, in the way that they were dealing with the situation. Um, that too sends a message of, of how the situation is going to resolve itself. Now, there is one thing that gives me some hope, perhaps that's the wrong word, um, but some, you know, some comfort that the situation in Kenya is unlikely 
to get as bad as it did in 2007 and 2008 following the post-election violence there where you know more than 1,000 people are estimated to have lost their lives. Um, and that is the sort of resilience displayed by many ordinary Kenyans that I met um, and spoke to. And let me give you one example of this. I took a Matatu, um, which is a local minibus from the city of Nakuru to get to Kisumu. The journey takes about five hours. Um, and about three hours into this journey, my Matatu suddenly stopped on the side of the road and kicked all the passengers out. We were a little bit confused at first, um, but then we were led by the driver to another Matatu. Um, and this new Matatu is what took us the rest of the way to Kisumu. Now, I did ask what was going on because this is certainly not normal practice. Um, and it turns out that the original minibus was owned by someone from the Kikuyu ethnic group, which is the ethnic group that is perceived to be aligned with President Uhuru Kenyatta. Now, he thought it was too dangerous to travel all the way into Luo territory. Um, the Luos are the group that dominates in the Kusumu area, and that is the ethnic group perceived to be aligned with Raila Odinga. Um, so instead what he did is he stopped his Kikuyu minibus halfway and loaded his passengers onto a Luo minibus. In the process, he kept himself safe, his vehicle safe, and his passengers safe. Coping mechanisms like this mean that even if the political tensions do get worse in Kenya, I think we are unlikely to see a full-scale repeat of the 2007-2008 violence. Um, and that is good news because the political situation remains unresolved. Um, as we stand, um, President Uhuru Kenyatta has declared has been declared the winner of that October 26 election, which of course is very controversial because Raila Odinga did not participate in it. And of course, Raila Odinga is refusing to recognize the results of that election. There are legal challenges before the Supreme Court um, challenging the veracity of that election. And Raila Odinga himself is now calling for a constitutional review. He wants the Kenyan constitution to be reworked and overhauled, and then new elections to be called probably sometime next year. Um, this situation is still very unstable. Um, there are lots of competing interests and competing motivations. Um, but my worry is that the politics of provocation are likely to trump the politics of peace and reconciliation if the rhetoric and the actions that I witnessed in Kisumu are anything to go by.